Welcome back, folks. UFC Edmonton is right around the corner, and I'm excited to, to break down this card with you guys. We're going to do that in just a moment, but I wanted to highlight a couple of things. All my links are in the description of this video. There is something called the Patreon. You guys are familiar with what Patreon is. It's where you can get access to, to the extra stuff from the creator. For, for me, you get my bets, you get you know my notes, you get, all, you get all sorts of little like extra things. You can check it out. You can sign up for free on Patreon. And the free side, you get a few things. But one thing that Patreon started doing recently is they allow you to purchase an individual post. I set mine at the lowest you can do is $3. And I set mine for that for my for my individual things because it's still going to be more expensive than paying for a month. But it does give you a sample of, oh, this is what this guy's content looks like on Patreon. I can check out the picks with confidence ratings. I can check out the bets, whatever. It's only three bucks. And that will give you an idea of if what I'm posting is, is what you're interested in. Now, there are a bunch of other people in the community with their own page, whether it's a website, a Patreon, whatever. A lot of them like to claim that, oh, mine's the best, this is the best, whatever. I'm not gonna tell you that. It depends on your style. There are a lot of profitable people in this space. I am profitable, many of them are profitable. You can see it, most of us have tracked bets. You can check those on any of those third-party websites. There's a lot of them, BetMMA tips is where I'm at. You can find out if someone's profitable Great, and if you wanna follow that person, awesome. Maybe you're not even following them because they're profitable, maybe you just like their content, that's cool too. Everybody's style's different, follow who you like. I'm not gonna tell you one way or the other, but if you would like to check out my stuff, I know this is a little longer than my normal intro, I would really appreciate it. Check out the Patreon, even just sign up for free. Check out the free stuff I throw out every now and then, and uh, you know, maybe we can interact over there. But either way, here we are at Featherweight where Jack Shore takes on Yusuf Zalal. The law is 5-0 in his last five, Shore being 3-2. and two. Uh, Now, in this matchup here, Zawal, he's on his second stint in the UFC. He's looked great since coming back. Jack Shore, he's now a featherweight. That is where he fights these days. But he was a bantamweight, and he had a lot of success down there. Now, when we break down these guys skill for skill, Zawal, good striker. He's got good movement. The knees are probably one of his weapons that I think are his most dangerous on the feet. He's got a good step-in knee, and he can turn that into a flying knee fairly easily. Um, he can fight well out of either stance, and he's very defensively responsible. But sometimes that can result in him being low volume. He'll stay outside, pick his shots, which is good. He'll kind of point fight guys. It's good for, you know, him not getting beat up or anything like that. But at the same time, it does result in low volume. So sometimes that's not the, the most exciting for a fan perspective. Um, he's shown really good grappling since being back in the UFC. He's got good submission defense. We've seen that in the past, but he has got decent takedowns as well. Um, he's gotten a lot of rear naked, in fact, two rear naked chokes since being back in the UFC. So maybe that's a stat I should have added there, or a little little, little plus sign. Um, the problem with his takedowns, though, is sometimes he shoots them from a, just a little bit too far out. And I don't know that that's going to be super successful against a guy like Shore. So he needs to watch out for that because Shore's a good wrestler in that of his own right. So we're going to have to check on that in a second. But uh, the takedown's decent, like I said. And he's good at reversing position if he is taken down as well. Uh, but one other thing to add. Lately, that, that other wrinkle that I mentioned is he's really good at getting that rear naked choke. It's because he's able to take the back of all these guys relatively quickly. Uh, when he gets to the mat, that's where he's looking to go. So uh, a couple of things for Zalal. There's a couple of recent developments that he's, that he's shown. Um, I do like that. But I think in the striking, he should be should be better here. Because on the other side, we got Jack Shore. His striking, it's basically just set up by his grappling threat. He tries to stay pretty responsible on the feet, defensively that is. He does fine. He's not too bad. But he's definitely a grappler through and through. He's good at taking the back, and once he does that, he likes to flatten the opponents out and just pepper them with strikes. Just nothing heavy, just trying to land as many with volume as he can, so that way they kind of give up the neck, and that's what happens when he gets the rear naked choke. That's his whole thing. He gets the takedowns from the wrestling clinch. So what, what that means is he kind of gets in, you know, kind of clinched up like so. Not the tie clinch, but like, you know, you get like an underhook, and overhook type of thing. That's what he's looking to do. Kind of, almost like, um, you see a lot in judo as well. It's kind of a judo clinch too. They're, they're similar, the wrestling style clinch and the judo style clinch. Um, you see more collar ties in the wrestling clinch than you do um, in judo. Not that you can't do that. It's just it's just you see more of it. Either way, um, good takedown defense. He's got a good sprawl. I could see him sprawling on those takedowns that are shot from a little too far out from Zawal. And I think that could be something that he uses to then maybe put into his own takedown. However, it's can he stay on top of Zawal? That's yet to be seen. Now, when I look at this matchup, how I see this going down, a couple of guys who both have pretty good grappling, a couple of guys who the striking is is, uh, I guess, more weighted on one side. And because of that, I think Yusuf Zawal is going to win. I think he's going to be able to keep this on the feet if he wants to, pick him apart from range, and win a decision that way. Or if it gets to the mat, I think he's good enough that maybe he can get the better of Shore in situations. Shore could get the better of him in situations. I don't think either guy's lost on the mat. 
In fact, I think Shore is probably the better grappler skill for skill. But I think the fact that it's now 145 pounds for Shore instead of 135 pounds has shown that he isn't as good in the grappling at that weight class just because guys are bigger there. So in size matters more in grappling than it does striking oftentimes as far as um, it's harder to move somebody off the top of you when they're heavier. But in striking, that you can still hit them if they're heavier. You know what I mean? Either way, pickings of all. Let me know what you guys think in the comments below. In the flyweight division where Jamie Lynn Horth takes on Ivana Petrovic. Now, in this one, very good matchmaking as far as records go. Both of them have very similar number of fights, 7-1 versus 6-1. Both are 4-1 in their last five. You'll love to see that stuff. It kind of gives you an idea of who to push, who to just kind of drop back down the ranks, see where, where, where people fall in their division. It's not like There's not like a big skill gap between them, so it's a really good way to kind of uh, figure out where the playing field sits. Uh, for Petrovic, good wrestling. Really good wrestling. I do like her body lock takedowns the best. She works to advance her position, and this is kind of how it works. Basically, she works her way to mount, starts getting her ground and pound going. Her opponent says, ah, oh, that really sucks, turns over, and then she they give up the rear naked choke. That is her sequence. That's why I put that little asterisk there to remind me to tell you guys that that's, that's the sequence. Uh, but either way, she works to get to mount, lands ground and pound, opponent turns over, goes for the rear naked choke. Systematically, that's how she beats most opponents. Uh, decent striking as well. It's basically there to get the grappling work in. She comes forward and she throws a one-two, looking to get the takedown. She wants to get that body lock. That's what she needs to do. She's a much better wrestler than she is a striker. On the other hand, Jamie Lynn Horth, decent striker. I would say better of the two decent strikers. Not all decent strikers are the same. She's got good kicks, basic combinations. She sticks to the, the bread and butter, does a good job with it. Um, pretty good power for, you know, a, a women's flyweight. Like it's, you know, not a lot of women's flyweights are just knocking people dead with one shot, but she's got good power for the division. Decent grappling. If you get her, if she gets on top of you, you're in trouble, and she is hard to hold down. But she doesn't have some of the more polished techniques. I wouldn't imagine her, you know she's going to go out there and hit some some wild submission on anyone. But she does the basics very well. That's what gets her by in these fights. That's how she's winning fights. That and she's also pretty big for the division. The line on this fight makes me really want to go with Petrovic, but I do think that. It, Horth is the rightful favorite. I just don't know if she's this much of a favorite, and that bothers me a lot. I'm going to take Horth for the, the pick. But by golly, Petrovic is not out of this fight, and I do think that this is going to be closer than that line suggests. I think we're getting a really, really good back-and-forth fight. But I'm going to take Horth. I might regret it later. This might be one you just have to sit back and watch and figure out where these two fall in the division. Maybe even crack yourself open a nice cold root beer while you're at it. And I'll see you guys next. next. Chad Anheliger takes on Cody Gibson. Gibson is two and three in his last five, three and two on the Anheliger side. Guys, I got to say, this is going to be a very fun fight for as long as it lasts. That's what I see here. A barn burner for whatever length of time we get. I don't think we get the full 15. I'm going to tell you why in a little bit, but I don't think we get the full 15. Uh, Cody Gibson here, he's a good striker. Uses his length really well because he's a very tall, long guy for the division. I think he's like 5'10 or something crazy like that. So he's going to have a big reach advantage here. He's got good teep kicks, uses those to keep his range. He's got a good long jab, and he can use that, obviously, to keep that range. Um, the problem that he has, though, is he's willing to back up at times. I don't know that he's going to do that here, but if he does back up, especially with a guy like Chad and Helger, who has forward pressure as one of, his, one of his key components, that can be a problem, and you can lose minutes that way. However, I do think the teep is going to be something he can use to keep that, that forward pressure off, and that long jab, obviously, is going to be hard to cross that danger zone. But I do think the willingness to back up is a problem for him. Um, good grappling as well. He has solid wrestling fundamentals. He's a good back taker. And if he does end up on the bottom, in the past, he hasn't been so good. But it's something he's developed recently where he is much more active from his back. And that's something we like to see. What are the analogous side? Dude's a decent striker. Um, good forward pressure. Decent amount of power. And he's got good combinations. He can put those together and land that that you know bit of power on you. I will say his power comes in, it, like, it, it reappears out of nowhere sometimes, just rises from the ashes like a phoenix and just <laughs> lands in a, in a fight. And you're like, where did that come from? Because it, it wasn't there in the last fight, but then it goes back and it settles back in into the ashes. And, uh, you know, then it just becomes like, all right, it's pretty good. He, you know, has some sting to his shots, but it's not like he's just one shot. And guys, it's, it's one of them things. But either way, decent power, decent combinations, decent grappling as well. His offense, basically offensively. He's got decent takedowns. He can mix it in, get the minutes with the grappling. The problem is his takedown defense is not that good, and his submission defense, he has, if he loses, a lot of times it's by submission, and that is why I don't think we're going 15. I think Gibson's going to sub him. I think that's what we get. I think Cody Gibson's going to take the back, get him a rear naked choke, and that's what I see happening. I don't know what round. We'll say round two for, for, for fun, for spits and wiggles, if you will. Uh, Cody Gibson submission, round two, rear naked choke. We're calling our shot. Man, wait, again, we got Siri City taking on Garrett Armfield. 
Uh, Armfield is 3-2 and two in his last five, 4-1 and one for City. Uh, when we look at this matchup, Garrett Armfield, he's a very well-rounded kind of fighter. He's got good striking, nice jab. He can even double that jab up to much success. Works the body well, and he does all this while wow coming forward. Also has good combinations, and he can work the leg kicks. And the leg kick might be a good idea for him in this matchup here. Uh, now, he's got good wrestling as well. He's got pretty good takedowns, and he can scramble very well. Typically, the striking is going to be what he goes to first. Wrestling is a later option for him, but we'll see how that plays out in this matchup. Now, for City, good striking. Uses that tie, uh, you know, tie boxing kind of style. Uh, clean straight punches. Works the body with those straight punches as well. And he does all this while coming forward. The one drawback I would say, and I didn't list it up here, but the one drawback I would say is sometimes he can forward press just too much and crowd his straight punches a little bit more than you'd like to see. Good grappling, good body lock takedown, but he does try to catch kicks. Now this can be good because he'll catch kicks for the takedown. That's great. But sometimes it can lead to him eating leg kicks while he's like reaching down to catch the kick instead of either checking the kick or getting his leg out of the way. So he can eat these leg kicks trying to catch them. So if they're throwing them low at the low calf, he'll try to reach down and catch the kick and end up just eating a leg kick for, for his troubles. Um, he has effective ground and pound when he gets it there. And he's pretty tough to take down because he's got a good sprawl and, you know, works the underhooks, things like that. Ultimately, in this matchup, I think it's going to be close. I think it's going to be a good fight back and forth. But give me the underdog in Garrett Armfield. The reason why is I think his forward pressure is going to be there. I think he's going to be able to use the leg kicks. And I think he's just going to be able to crowd Siri City enough that while he's able to land his shots, both guys are going to be able to land their shots, I mean. But he's going to be able to one coming forward. And I think that's going to be enough to get him the nod on the scorecards. So that's how I think it's going to be. Close fight. I'll take the dog in Armfield. Let me know what you guys think. And a straightforward fight here at heavyweight where Alexander Romanov takes on Rodrigo Nascimento. And for Nascimento, he's 3 1 in a no contest in his last five fights, 2 and 3 on the Romanov side. We'll start with Nascimento. Now, decent striker. He basically throws pretty decent combinations as he comes forward. And that's what he's going to do in the striking. But he's got good jujitsu. And in the heavyweight division, it's really hard to work from the bottom. So he's typically going to have to get on top because if, especially with a guy the size of Romanov, can you Im imagine just being under that guy and trying to like work some sweeps or whatever off your back or like try to, you know, do some sort of anything. And you just got this blob on top of you where you just feel like you're getting smothered in like a blanket of belly fat. Yeah, that'd be horrible. So I don't imagine he's going to have much success off his back, but he does have good takedown defense, which he's going to need. But if he gets on top, his top pressure is pretty good, and he can start working for submissions if he needs to uh, go that route. Otherwise, he can just lay on him and probably get a decision. Now, for Romanov, this guy needs to start fast because his cardio doesn't last. So quick starter, cardio, that kind of that was cool. That rhymed. Uh, solid wrestling, good takedowns. He's got pretty big slams. He likes to do that. Part of the reason his cardio fades is because well, he's a giant human being, and he does all these big explosive movements. He has a very mauling sort of style. He just wants to smash your face with his elbow and like his forearm and stuff, and they just land big ground and pound. It's great. It's awesome if he can get you out of there. If he can't, he's toast after the first round. His striking, it's powerful, but it's very sloppy. On the feet, he's going to be outmatched even by somebody like uh, Nascimento, who's typically a jujitsu kind of guy. Honestly, in this one, I just can't pick Romanov because I just don't think he's going to last more than that first five minutes. And after that, I think you know, the remaining 10 minutes in the fight, he's toast. So he needs to finish early, and I just don't see it happening um, at a high clip. It can happen, definitely can. So I can see Romanov getting the win, but I also think Nascimento wins probably more often than not. So we're taking Nascimento. Let me know what you guys think, Wait's and I'll see you next. next. Charles Jordan takes on Victor Henry. Henry is 3-1 in a no contest in his last five. We've got two and three for Jordan in his last five. Uh, when we look at Henry, solid striker, volume-heavy approach with the body kick being a pivotal point of that offense. Um, he's got good counter strikes as well and moves pretty much all the time when he's on the feet. So that helps him a lot at, you know, making him harder to hit because he's constantly moving while he's throwing strikes. Uh, solid grappling as well. He kind of just overwhelms his opponents with ground and pound. And that's how he, he uses that to advance his position on the map. Um, he mixes his takedowns well with his strikes and he can scramble very well. But the problem is his inconsistency and I guess his age as well. The guy's getting up there at like 37 or something like that. And at, at 135 pounds, that is a bit older. We're going to see him fall off pretty soon, you got to imagine, but he hasn't really shown it yet. So um, inconsistency, every now and then he just kind of overperforms, and then we overrate him in, in, a, in a match later. And uh, he never really super underperforms, but he definitely sometimes will overperform, and then that'll bring him – it, it makes it hard to find his baseline, if that makes sense. So I guess you could say that's over or underperforming if we're – I don't know, whatever. Point is, it's not that always consistent. But his cardio is fantastic, or at least it has been up till this point. We'll see. Like I said, he's getting older. 
Um, he's fighting Charles Ordain, who's now coming back down to 135 pounds. He was a featherweight for a while there. Now he's at 135. Not really something you like to see, especially when a guy's been losing a couple of fights lately and then they move down. So um, good striking, though. Good volume. I like that as well. I don't think he's going to have the volume of Henry, but he has good volume. Um, good movement. Combinations. Puts those together very well. His kicks are some of his better weapons on the feet. He's got a very good front kick as well, something that's kind of underrated in MMA. That front kick from Jordan is is definitely a good weapon for him, especially against somebody like Henry. Uh, front kick's going to hit the target more than a roundhouse kick. It's going to hit straight down the pipe, going to put them back before they can hit you with a roundhouse. Uh, good grappling as well. He's very active from his back. He stays very safe on top. And he's got a really good front choke series. He can use that to either defend takedowns or just snatch that up from any position, really. Um, just, just about anyway. Um, takedown defense has been lacking in the past. I don't think it's a huge hole in his game, but it is there. It looked better in a few fights, but then again, it was against like Kron Gracie, who doesn't really shoot takedowns super well. He just kind of hopes you end up on the mat with him. So there is that. Ultimately for me, I think this fight comes down to the fact that I think Henry's going to be the busier striker. I think he's going to be faster, and I think he's just going to have way more output um, as well as being able to mix in the takedowns. The only thing that gives me a little bit of pause is the age. But other, other than that, I am on the Victor Henry side. So we are taking him as the pick. Let me know what you think, though, and I will see you in the next matchup next. And I'm kind of excited for this one. This is a matchup between a couple of ladies who have been really making their name in the division. We have Ariane Lipsky or Lipsky da Silva. I feel like she has all of that together now. I'm not sure how it went. But she was Lipsky, got married, was Ariane da Silva. It's now on Topologies, back to Lipsky. I think it's Lipsky to Silva. I don't know. Either way, whatever, you know who I'm talking about. And Jasmine, Jasso DeVicius, she is 4-1 in her last five, 3-2 and two on the Lipsky side. Very good matchup because it's essentially going to be this. Can one side get their game going before the other one? Because one is a striker predominantly, one is a grappler predominantly. When we look at this, Jasmine, Jasso DeVicius, she's definitely the grappler. Solid wrestling, very good top pressure, good takedown defense. She's got good submission defense, so she usually stays safe on top. Excellent cage push, can control her opponents there, and the ground and pound. The ground and pound is brutal. We saw what she did to poor Priscilla Cachuera back when they were in, I think it was Toronto. Um, so the last Canadian card that was, a, I think it was a pay-per-view, and uh, she just brutalized that poor woman. So that, that you know, the ground and pound is there. Um, decent striking. It's not great, but she comes forward with a ton of volume, and she's tougher than a $2 steak, just coming in, throwing punches, doing what she needs to do, and eating whatever, coming back at her. The problem with that is obviously you don't want to get pieced up. The judges don't like that so much for your score, but it makes it hard for her opponents to just keep up with that intense volume of hers as well as the forward pressure. So she's able to get her wrestling going because she just walks through the storm. Um, great cardio. She can do the same thing in the third round as she can in the first. So you, you always got to count on Jazz Davicius still being there in the end of the fight. For Lipsky, she's a very good striker. She always has been, right? And she's got solid kicks, very good flurries, combination. She puts her punches and kicks together really well. She's got that Muay Thai style. Very, very good in the striking. But something that's really developed lately, it's her grappling. Her jiu-jitsu's always been pretty good. She's always had really nasty submissions off of her back. Did that over in, like I believe it was KSW, where she was just ripping people in half with the submissions. But recently, her takedown defense has actually gotten quite a bit better. She does have decent takedown defense now because before, it was terrible. She would just get taken down and controlled. Uh, now, she can fight those takedowns off pretty well. But the problem is... Once she does get flattened out, she does get controlled a bit, and that's that's just something that's really hard to uh, hard to you know hard to fight back once you're flattened out completely, especially when the when your opponent can throw strikes. It's different in like a jujitsu match where you don't have to worry about you know just committing all of your body, arms, legs, everything to push someone away because you can't do that as much in MMA because you just leave your face wide open. So that's what happens in MMA. So a lot of people when they get stuck, flattened out, and all that, they get held down, and some people figured out how to counter it. Most don't. Lipsky has not yet, but she may. This might be the first fight we see it. But her takedown defense has gotten a lot better. If she keeps this on the feet, she's going to be the much more technical striker. She's going to be the much more, um, you know, I mean, maybe not volume heavy striker, but she's definitely going to have the cleaner combinations, all that good stuff. The thing that I see happening, though, if uh, Jazz Vicious is not able to get the takedowns, she's going to push her up against the cage, muscle her up there, and win minutes that way. Give me Jazz Davicius because I think she has multiple paths, and the main one being the takedowns, laying on the ground and pound, doing that way. But the cage push, the wall install, it's an underrated technique in MMA. People use it. It's boring, but it gets the job done. We're taking Jazz Davicius. She has options. I don't think she wins a striking match, but I think she can get the grappling going. Let me know what you guys well, think. And what's next? Eamon Zahabi takes on Pedro Munoz. Now, for Zahabi, he's 4-1 in his last five. Very good form as of late. Pedro Munoz seems to be on a, a bit of a slide. He's won three in a no contest. 
in his last five fights. So hasn't looked that great, but he's been fighting some of the better competition in the division. So take that for what you will. When we look at Munoz's skills, he's a solid striker. He's got very good forward pressure, counters very well, even while moving forward. And he's got a nasty leg kick. The volume on the leg kick is there. And also after he's had success to the leg, he can snap that same kick right up to the body and have success with that. Because once you start worrying about the leg, now the body becomes available. Now he has very good skills in the pocket. And the problem is he wants to get there and he, he can get caught chasing, trying to get there. So he, instead of being able to, you know, stay outside and use his leg kick and do that, like he, he feels that he needs to get in the pocket. And I understand that makes sense because that's where he's best. So he'll come forward and he'll keep trying to chase, throwing those leg kicks as he's coming in, counter striking his way in, but his striking defense suffers because of it. Thankfully for him, he's very, very durable. Striking defense suffers because of it and he can get caught trying to chase. Like I said, now, in the grappling department, he's got very good takedown defense, and not very many people are going to be able to take him down. But if they try, sometimes they can end up in a front choke because he's got very slick front chokes as well. On the Zahabi side, he's a good striker. Plenty of power. Looks, looks pretty good there. Good counters. Picks his shots really well. But the biggest problem is his output, his volume, is almost entirely dependent upon his opponent because he's not the type that's going to want to go first. He wants to make his opponent go first so he can counter strike, which is fine for him sometimes, but oftentimes it can result in a staring contest. Now, I don't think that's going to be the case here because I think Munoz is going to have no problem coming forward and throwing volume, but we'll see. Uh, he also will allow his opponents to move forward. So even if he's landing shots, he can lose rounds simply because the optics don't look that great when you're on, on the back foot the whole time. So there is that. Um, good takedown defense, but once he does get taken down, he can be held down once you get him down and flattened out. So there is that. Now, when we look at these these two as they match up, the thing is, I would honestly take Munoz if this was a couple of years ago, but I think we're seeing signs of the decline, and that solid striking might be slightly down to a good striking now, or, you know, maybe he's just slipping just a little bit, and I realize both of these guys are kind of older, but the hobbies look great lately. I understand the level of competition is different between the two. Munoz just fought the better guys, but I'm going to take the guy with the momentum right now in Eamon Zahabi in a pretty low confidence pick, but I do very confidently believe this fight goes to decision. So do with that information what you will. And I'm Malat taking on Trevin Giles in the welterweight division. Malat, four and one in his last five fights. He's looking to bounce back after coming up a little bit short in his last one against Neil Magny, which he was a massive favorite in that. So that, you know, kind of derailed the hype for Malat. But he's fighting Trevin Giles, who's kind of been on a rough skid. He's two and three in his last five fights. Not really what you want to see, uh, but for, for Trevin Giles, he's good everywhere. He just somehow finds these ways to lose fights. He's a good striker. Everybody's going to tell you about his jab. He sticks that jab extremely well. It's it's justifiable that everyone's going to tell you about his jab because it's darn good. He's got good combinations, good footwork, and he can counter strike extremely well. But the problem is his output. His volume is just not there, at least most of the time, and that's a problem for him. So he can lose fights just by not doing enough. Um, grappling, he's good there as well. He's got good takedowns. He's got... Pretty good top control. His takedown defense is there. But it's just he's just not doing enough. So that's the problem that I see for Trevin Giles. Or sometimes he gets finished because, you know, it happens. But typically he's just not doing enough. Uh, for Mike Malat, dude's very good on the feet. His defense is a bit laxing, or you know, lacking, sorry. But his uh, power's there. Good counter striking. He controls the range really well. And he can put his punches and kicks together in combination extremely well. The dude's a very good offensive striker. But like I said, He's going to get jabbed up here because his striking defense, eh. But he's going to be a lot of jabs is the thing. The jabs, you're, you're not getting knocked out by a jab most of the time, especially not, you know, outside of like a heavyweight division. But either way, I do think he's going to have some some damage on the face, but I think he's going to have more output. And I think he's going to be able to use his striking on the feet to get the to get the favor if it goes to the judges' scorecards. Now, in the grappling, he's got good takedown defense as well. Very craft, crafty submissions, and he's very quick to attack these submissions. All in all, I think this is Mike Mollat's fight to lose. If he fades and gasses out really hard like he did against Neil Magny, sure, he could lose the fight. But Trevin Giles is not Neil Magny. Neil Magny gets a lot of crap for being this guy that they just bring in there to lose, but he's not bad. Neil Magny is actually really good as a fighter. The only people he's losing to are top-tier guys, and sure, he lost most of the fight to Mike Mollat because Mike Mollat's extremely talented. He fell apart in the last round. It happens. It was the lesson he needed to learn in that fight. I think this is a very good bounce-back spot. So give me, give me proper Mike to get this one done. We're taking Mike Malat. Let me know what you guys have, and I'll Middle see you next. From Marc-Andre Barrio takes on Dustin Stolzfus. Now, both of these guys are two and three in their last five fights. And for Dustin Stolzfus, he is a decent striker, but that's usually where he loses fights. Um, he's got decent power. He's got pretty good kicks, but sometimes you know he ends up striking with guys that are a better striker than him, and that's not been good for him 
thus far in the UFC. He's a pretty good grappler, though. He's got a large toolbox. He likes to slam guys down with some, some emphasis on it. He can attack submissions. And he's got a good submission arsenal as well. And he can sweep from his from the bottom. So it, it's one of those things where Dustin Solstice is probably going to be the better grappler in this matchup. Uh, might even be the better skill-for-skill skill fighter. But he's going against a guy like Mark andre Barrio, who's extremely good at just coming forward, throwing volume, getting hit but not caring, and just keep on coming. When it gets to the wrestling as well, he can push guys up against the cage and strike well against the cage. This is an underutilized technique in the UFC. Is guys that can get in that cage push and actually land damage. Barrio does that very well. It's the high motor that he has that is the biggest problem for, for his opponents. And I think that's what he's going to use here to get the win. I think it's going to be a close fight, back and forth fight. But I think Barrio is going to have a, a, the, the better output. That high motor, like I talked about, is going to get him the win here. So we're taking Marc-Andre Barrio to get the win. Let me know what you have in the comments below. Oh boy, we've got a matchup with some unknowns here. We've got Kyle Machado coming down to 205 pounds in this matchup. Taking on Brenton Hubero, who... Just kind of a wild man. So in this one, both guys are three and two in their last five fights. Hibero, decent striker, good long rangey straights, lots of power, good leg kick. But his grappling, I feel like, is actually better. It's just sometimes he makes questionable decisions. He's got good grappling. He's very active from his back. He attacks submissions. He's got that high elbow guillotine that he likes to use. He can sweep, but oftentimes he accepts the bottom position for too long. Um, he does have good ground and pound if he is on top, and that's what he's going to typically go for once he's on top. Um, he's very kill or be killed, though, and that is a problem for him because a lot of times if he doesn't get the finish, he just falls apart. So not a lot to say. It's hard to really know what you're getting with Hibero. On the other side, Kyle Machado, he's now coming down from heavyweight. So here he is. He's a decent striker. Front kicks and knees up the middle. Love it. Combos, sometimes they're good. Other times he just puts his chin up like this and runs forward with one, two punches that are like hardly punches. Just like that. I know it looks goofy, but he does that sometimes. So very strange. But other times he has clean combinations. So I don't know. Um, good clinch. That's his best game. If he gets in the clinch here, he better was in trouble. He's got good skipping knees and he strikes extremely well on the break. Uh, Jiu-Jitsu. He's got a quick arm bar from his back. We've seen that before, but also he somehow just ends up on top when guys shoot takedowns on him. And I don't know what that is. I don't know how he does that. He just somehow just ends up on top. Doesn't look, I mean, a lot of times it's from the level of competition he's fighting, but he ends up on top. Honestly, I'm going to take Kyle Machado because I trust his cardio to last longer and I trust him to still be there in the third where I don't so much trust Hibero to be there in the third. So we're taking Kyle Machado, but yeah, yeah just, just pass on this one, guys. Just stay away. It's a weird fight. It's a fight where we don't know a lot yet, but we're going to find out. So I'll Heavyweight next. Strikers next, where the Black Beast, Derek Lewis, takes on Jonathan Denise. Denise is 8-0, undefeated. So obviously 5-0 in the last five. He's taking on Derek Lewis, who has 2-3 and three in his last five. However, his last three fights, he's looked a little bit better. He's 2-1 and one in the last three. It's... It, he went from fighting some pretty good competition, him not looking that great, kind of looking like he didn't want to be there anymore, to something changing. He looks a little more revitalized ever since he did that, you know, short, like, what, 30-second flying knee and getting the win? Maybe not even 30 seconds. So out, uh, after that, Derek Lewis looked a lot better. Um, so that's interesting to see. He's got he's the revitalized version of the Black Beast. When we look at this one, Jonathan Denise, he's a solid striker, kickboxing background, strikes to all levels, very good power. Good combinations, and he's actually pretty defensively sound for a for a heavyweight striker. Um, good knees up the middle as well, but we just don't know much about his grappling. We don't know much. We've seen him getting taken down um, and held down for a round. That was a that was a thing that happened, but realistically, we haven't seen a ton of it enough to really get a good good uh, read on it yet. I would say maybe maybe this fight. Who knows? Maybe Derek Lewis is going to go out there and start shooting some takedowns. Um, he's done it before, so maybe. Um, good striking for Derek Lewis as well. He throws single shots, which could be a problem for him, but it's usually just because the dude only needs one. This dude's power is incredible. He holds the, the record for knockouts in the UFC, extreme, extreme amounts of power, and he's extremely good at keeping that power late. So he can knock you out in the first round, the third round, fifth round if you're in, in a you know five-round fight. Obviously, this one is three, so there you go. Very good counters, and his timing is excellent. The reason he throws single shots could be just because he doesn't usually need more than one shot, and his timing is very good. But it could be, it would be nice to see Derek Lewis start to put together a few punches and combinations. We have seen him add some wrinkles to his game lately, though, and that's been that's been good for him. He's also freakishly athletic for a guy his size. It just you don't you don't think that, but then when you just see the guy just stand up like he does when somebody's on top, or like do that flying knee like we saw, the guy's more athletic than you give him credit for just by looking at him. Honestly, this is a tough fight to call because Jonathan Denise is the cleaner striker. He's probably the better striker, but this is the type of thing where I could just see Derek Lewis putting him out. And uh, Derek Lewis is the type of guy you want to bet on as an underdog, which is what he is right here. 
And I could also see him going out there and saying, look, this dude's a heck of a striker. What if I shoot a takedown on him? I bet I could get one. And then he gets one. So I'm going to take Derek Lewis, but I don't, you know, it's hard to really bet on a Derek Lewis fight for the simple fact that you just don't know what you're going to get. But I'm starting to think that lately he's looked pretty good. So we'll see. The Patreon folks will know if I bet on him. I'm taking Derek Lewis in the matchup, partially because I want to root for him, partially because I think that power is incredible and I think he can put anybody out at any moment. Let me know what you guys, guys think. If you I'll... ask me, this is the most compelling fight on the card because it means so much for the division. And also it's between a couple of fighters where both of them, we really, we really, it's going to be really hard to see where they're at in this division without them facing each other because both of them seem to have the same kind of hurdle to overcome, right? Both of them struggle with, with opponents in the division who are just more physical than they are. Now, Rose Namajunas, she's three and two in her last five fights. She's come up from straw weight recently. Uh, she's now at flyweight. She's more, she's established herself now as a flyweight, which is good for her. Um, and she's looked pretty good. Now on the other side, Erin Blanchfield, she has that blemish in the career that she just recently got when she fought Mignon Firo, who has beaten both of these two, by the way. Uh, but she didn't look good at all in that fight. And it was just because she was out physical and she was stuck in a world where she had to strike with a much better striker. And that was a big problem for her. So now she's four and one in her last five fights. How is she going to bounce back? She's young, up and coming should be developing like rapidly in between these fights. and But she's fighting a girl in her prime who's been there, done that, been a two-time champion at straw weight, and is still looking fantastic at flyweight. So this is an extremely compelling matchup. Um, and like I said, the most compelling on the card for me because of the implications for the division and as well as just because it's, it's really going to tell us where these two are at in the division. When we look at this, Erin Blanchfield, she's an excellent grappler. People aren't going to think that because she couldn't get the takedowns on Fioro. I don't think that was so much of the uh, lack of grappling skill, but a lack of knowing that on the feet, she doesn't have anything that's threatening. So Furo, if she didn't have anything that could threaten Furo, she just couldn't get the takedowns because she couldn't threaten enough with the striking to set him up. And then also the physicality was there on the Furo side that really led to Blanchfield struggling a lot. So I do think she's an excellent grappler. The takedowns, uh, iffy if it's against someone that has a lot of physicality. So that could be a problem for her. Typically, she has a mix of traditional and trip takedowns, which is something you don't see often in women's MMA is traditional wrestling style takedowns. Rose has those as well. We're going to go over that in a minute. But these two ladies both use the traditional wrestling style takedowns at times. And that's something that's kind of cool to see because, it, like I said, it's not something that's common in women's MMA just because, you know, for the longest time, women didn't go, grow up doing wrestling. It's, it wasn't a popular women's sport. It is now, but it wasn't for a while. Um, Erin, she has a large toolbox. She, has, she seems to have every weapon she could need in the grappling realm. She's very good at advancing position, and her best position is the crucifix. Once she gets to that crucifix position, that is the end of the night for most people. And it's actually the mounted crucifix that she likes to do, the one where she is on top rather than on the bottom and the backside, whatever. Um, so there, that is what she wants to get to. She's got solid ground and pound. She likes to snatch up submissions while she's threatening to pass the position. So she'll make you have to work to stop her from passing and then take what you give her in that for that submission. And if she can't get the takedown, if the opponent isn't, you know, going to be way more physical, she can result to the cage push. We saw her do that against Tyler Santos. And I don't know if you noticed this, but, you know, a lot of people were like, oh, but Tyler Santos isn't with the promotion anymore. Tyler Santos didn't get cut because she wasn't good enough. She just chose not to renew so she could go to PFL and try to win a million dollars. It wasn't, it wasn't like she got cut because she sucked. So get that out of your head, guys. Get that out of your head. I hear a lot of people saying that, oh, yeah, she's got to win over Tyler Santos, but she's not even in the UFC anymore. That's You're misleading people, and that's not cool. So either way, that's the point. I will call her a good striker, and I'm going to get a lot of pushback from this. She's not as good of a striker as Rose, that's for sure. She's not as good a striker as Manon Fioro, that's for sure. But she is a good striker because she's got a lot of volume and a lot of forward pressure. That is what she has that does really well. She's got pretty good movement as well. Um, defensively, she showed some lap, uh, lapses, and, but she's got a good head kick and she's going to come forward and she's going to throw a lot of volume. And even in losses, you never see her stop coming forward and throwing volume. So that I do like, I will give her the good rating there. Like I said, she struggles with opponents that are much more physical than her. And I could say probably the same for Nami Yunus, but she hasn't shown it as much. Um, she did do a little bit better against Fioro than, than Blanchfield did. So could that be game planning? Could that just be stylistic uh, matchups? Either or. Now, when we look at Rose Damianis, much more well-rounded. She's a very solid striker, very good combinations, very good footwork, head movement. She uses feints extremely well. In the striking department, she's going to be far better than Blanchfield. 
She's got really good striking speed. Her head kick is awesome, and she also has a very good lead hook. Head kick, lead hook, those are her two best weapons on the feet. Fast, good at setting them up with her feints, good movement. Sometimes the mental hurdles get in the way. We saw it in the Esparza fight. Um, we've, seen, we've seen it in other fights as well where she just kind of either freezes up or something. Sometimes things go wrong. You can blame it on her corner because she's got that Pat Berry guy over there and he's kind of a weirdo, um, you know, her husband and all. Uh, that could be part of it. But also it's just like sometimes she just, it, she has some things to her. Now, I'm not saying that she will in this fight. She might be, you know, just on her A game, but who knows? It's hard to say. Solid grappler as well. She's got a good sprawl. Um, if she doesn't hit that initial sprawl, the takedown defense isn't exactly the best. Once somebody can get to like a body lock to her, they can usually drag her to the mat, especially at flyweight where she is a bit smaller. Yes, she's filled out for the division a bit, but she still is naturally a straw weight. Um, she's got good activity off of her back, so that's what you like to see. Good takedowns. She has very good timing on her takedowns. Probably the best timing in the division as far as when she shoots those takedowns. Um, extremely good in the in that that trip range where she can get to the body lock and start working trips, or from the tie clinch and working trips. Also good traditional takedowns as well. Ground and pound volume. I like that. And even from top or bottom, she's using her elbows, which is key here. Because if she ends up on the bottom and she's able to land some elbows, maybe get a cut, she could potentially win a round off of her back. And that is something that is underutilized. We've seen it happen before. Shara Magomedov actually did that when he fought Bruno Silva and won a, won a round off. Actually, might have won two rounds off of his back with elbows. So that's something that we could see here as well. Very good transitions, good back taker, and a very good rear naked choke. Now. When I look at these two, skill for skill. If this fight stays on the feet, it's Nami Yunus all day. But if it gets to the mat, I honestly think Blanchfield is just a, a level or so ahead of Rose Nami Yunus. And that's not to say that Nami Yunus is a bad grappler. Fantastic grappler, very good grappler. I think Blanchfield's grappling is just, just next level. The problem is if she doesn't get the fight to the mat. I think she can get the fight to the mat here over the course of these five rounds. We've, se we've seen her keep going for five rounds. Neither of these two are going to be having cardio troubles. And I think if it gets to the mat, Blanchfield is going to have a lot of success. I'm going to take her in this matchup. Maybe I'm dumb. Maybe I'm making a crazy decision. I'm going to sit this one out as far as betting. I didn't even want to pick a side. In fact, actually, I was messaging back with one of the uh, one of the fans of the channel recently as well. It was yesterday, and we were uh, we were talking back and forth on this matchup specifically. And I was like, I keep going back and forth on my pick. I don't really know. Threw some ideas off of each other, and ultimately, I ended up deciding on Blanchfield. Not with that conversation, but later. But it's close. It's real close. I'm kicking my feet up on a coffee table. I'm cracking open a nice cold root beer. And I'm going to enjoy the show. Guys, if you made it this far in the video and you're enjoying yourself, please like this video. And I will see Main you in the event main. of the evening, folks. It's Brandon Moreno taking on Amir Albazi in the flyweight division in a matchup that probably has some pretty big title implications, at least for the Albazi side. You would assume for Moreno as well. But at the same time, he's 2-3 and three in his last five fights. He's had a lot of title fights, and he's come up short in a couple of a uh, couple of elimination bouts. So it's more on the on the Albazi Al side, if you ask me, because Albazi's five and zero in his last five, but he hasn't fought in quite some time, and that's because he's coming back from some serious injuries. Now we understand Brandon Moreno is taking a little bit of time off. Albazi's been out even longer because of the injuries. Now, when we look at this matchup, this is going to be an interesting grappler versus striker for the most part fight. Um, and something I want to point out real quick is I often have more notes than I write on the board. Sometimes I write everything up. Sometimes I don't. If you want to see the rest of the notes, they're over on Patreon. Yes, they're behind a paywall. If you want to pay for them, great. If you don't, just watch, look at these notes. It's fine. If I do a really in-depth, deep dive on a fighter, you'll often get to see all of my notes on them. But either way, here we go. We're going to break this one down. Amir Albazi, solid grappler, good takedowns, and I love the timing on the takedowns. He has really good transitions, control when he takes, to, takes his position. Um, good back taker, and he start working for the rear naked choke. That's going to be the best weapon for him, but also he has a pretty good sub arsenal just in general. The guy, if he can get this fight to the mat, he's going to have a lot of success here because although Brandon Moreno is a skilled grappler, I think Albazi is going to be a step ahead. Now on the feet, he's pretty good there. He's got a solid jab, pretty good power, and he picks his shots really well, but I think he's going to be outmatched in the striking because when I look at Brandon Moreno, this dude is a solid striker with very good combinations. He doubles up the same side, and he has extremely quick hands. What do I mean by doubles up the same side? It could be like a one three or something like that, or he can, um, you know, he can go two six. You know, he he puts his his punches together where he can double up the same side without any trouble. And a lot of people have trouble doing that because they they don't they don't have the ability to throw a punch and then reset that punch without it being awkward. Reset that arm without it being awkward. So Miranda does a great job there. He draws out his opponent's strikes. 
either with feints or by throwing a strike of his own and getting them to try to counter back. And then he'll follow it with a counter of his own. And he does a really good job at that. He works the body well with both punches and kicks. And I think that's going to be something he's going to need to use uh, to have a lot of success in this fight is working the body well. Um, because I think if he is able to do that, it'll help because the, the angle on the punches, punches specifically, not as much with kicks, you can get those caught, but uh, punches specifically, if he's working the body here, it also can work as a bit of a takedown defense. Because when you're throwing up high, somebody can duck underneath that takedown and get to your hips, or under that and shoot a takedown and get to your hips, sorry. But if you're throwing low to the body, it's hard. You can't, it's, it's a lot harder just to duck under that because then you end up eating that shot as you're getting to the hips. So I think working the body is going to help him a lot here for defending takedowns as well as for, you know, landing pretty significant shots in the grappling he's not he's not washed on the grappling this guy's great he's gonna have he's gonna have a good uh account of himself in the grappling he can mix in his own takedowns he's a good back taker in his own right he's got good control from there he's got them choking arms long skinny lanky arms the thing that i think sets brendan Moreno apart from a lot of guys is the cardio dude doesn't get tired at least hasn't really shown it from the fights i've seen so in this one though i think it's kind of one of those things where one guy's on the way up one guy's kind of already reached that point and i know brandon moreno is still young like he's not he's not old by any means but he's been there he's done that he's had a long career he's had a pretty lengthy you know career in the ufc thus far um yeah it's uh i think albazi's time i think he's gonna be able to get the takedowns control at least three rounds and win that win the fight that way i don't think he's gonna finish him i think it's gonna be a good fight back and forth moreno's gonna have some really big moments in the in the rounds he's winning but I think three of the rounds are going to go to Albazi, and I think he's going to win the fight that way. Three rounds to two, going to be able to get the control, going to be able to get the fight to the mat. I think he lands some shots on the feet too, just maybe not. Because, I mean, Brandon Moreno, is, it's not like he doesn't get hit. The dude gets hit. Um, it's just he usually is doing more on the feet than the, the opponent. So I'm going to take Albazi to get the win. I think this is his time to get it done. Um, I think at some point soon, if he, I think if he gets this win, he probably gets a title shot, and I think he knows that. So this is going to be very important for him to get the win, and I think that's going to help him get this one done but let me know what you guys think i do appreciate you tuning in i know a lot of people are on the moreno side i don't blame them a bit i just happen to be on the opposite side and if you disagree let me know in the comments and tell me how silly i am and then after the fight when you when either you or i are right you can come back there and either say i suck or eh, okay i should listen to you anyway see you guys next time thank you so much for watching i'll talk to you soon